Bueno, buenos días a todos y a todas. Muchísimas gracias eh, por venir. Hoy damos comienzo a la segunda jornada del eh, workshop Over Tourist City. Eh, la sesión de hoy es eh, la turistificación como problema transversal y al igual que ayer eh, centramos un poco más en la presentación de los resultados del proyecto, lo poníamos en relación también con bueno, con actores y asociaciones y colectivos locales. Eh, hoy la idea es más bien eh, este enfoque transversal que es tanto la idea de poner en discusión tanto eh, desde una transversalidad disciplinar, es decir, desde distintos lugares en los que eh, el problema de la turistificación y en general eh, la cuestión urbana se analiza y se estudia desde distintos sitios, como puede ser la geografía, la sociología, la antropología, la economía política eh, y también la arquitectura y el urbanismo. Eh, entonces, también con esa idea, pues un poco habíamos eh, invitado a, a colegas de, de distintos lugares de, de, del Estado español, desde los que se está trabajando desde hace mucho tiempo eh, el problema de la turistificación, eh, y también a distintos, eh, digamos, eh, actores en el campo internacional, ¿no? Y, bueno, hoy empezamos con eh, la conferencia inaugural de eh, Luis Moreno, que será en inglés, eh, y yo voy a pasar a introducirlo también en, en inglés. So, thank you very much, uh, Luis, for accepting this invitation, that's in a way... Eh, It was started in a, in a bar in, in Lagunillas about some debates we had between uh, things that we were working in a way in different forms, uh, studying these relations between the state form and the city form and how these things could work together. So today the, the presentation is not exactly about tourism or touristification, but more about a kind of... Uh, the some yeah urban theory approaches that are in some ways behind the same uh, problems that we have in things like touristification or how the cities are uh, developed and shaped mm. so uh luis moreno uh, is part of uh, goldsmith university of london in the uk in the department of uh, visual cultures and also the center of research architecture Uh, he's also an uh, editor of the uh, journal. Uh, not anymore, okay. So he, he was <laughs> part of yeah. uh, the, the journal City. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, his uh, investigations, research process, and also uh, teaching and writing explores the relation, the spatial relations, and, and also political economic forces that, in a way, configure the social and cultural shapes of the everyday life. So there is a lot uh, I could say, but uh, I think it's yeah better if we focus on uh, your talk. And again, thank you very much. And I, I leave you with uh, Luis and with the uh, lecture, The Spatial uh, Conjecture of New Urbanism, the case of King Cross and Tottenham. Okay. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks, Kike. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, thanks, Kike, and thanks, Laura, as well, for um, sorting out all the organization, for getting me here. Um, thanks also to Stefan Novotnys in the audience who introduced me to Kike, um, where we had this um, three here. If you stand up, maybe you, you should okay, yeah. use this. Yeah. Yeah. Can you? Yeah. yeah, can you hear me? Okay, um, and thanks also to Stefan who invited me to Malaga and I got to know Kike and we got to talking about, um, yeah, as Kike was saying, a kind of interests in uh, urban theory and also philosophy, uh, but how they are uh, dialectically bound up with kind of material struggles, class struggles over the, the shape and form and the use of the city, and also what the city can become and what it might be become, given that the city operates under uh, constraints, thresholds, active kind of policing, that always ensures that what urban space is produced 
uh, for is always to serve a kind of an accumulation process, the, the accumulation of capital. And it was from that conversation with Kike that he, um, he mentioned you having this conference on over tourism or over touristification. Now, I'm not going to talk about tourism um, or over touristification, uh, but what I do want to talk about is uh, over accumulation. So maybe the remarks that I'm going to make, uh, they may be useful for this conference in, re in, in thinking about how um, the, the over accumulation of capital um, has actually become um, the basis and the, the kind of normative framework, right, for um, the solutions that architects and urban designers and um, planners are looking for from um, public-private partnerships. Um, so the over-accumulation of capital, I want to suggest, has become um, the basic kind of operating system today of, um, of urbanism. It, it, and, and it takes a kind of a cultural form and it kind of materializes and it kind of crystallizes out in this case study I want to talk about, which is the urban regeneration of King's Cross. Um, so what I want to do then is think about um, urban accumulation, over accumulation as this kind of quantitative pressure that generates um, a set of qualitative um, experimental kind of results in the way in which the social relations of the city, the urban ensemble of social relations of the city are being tested and experimented with in order to find you know, what Marx would call new approaches to the kind of valorization of capital. Because okay. when Marx was thinking about um, over-accumulation, in, um, in his theory, in his crisis theory, over-accumulation processes um, explode out in kind of speculative bubbles, speculative financial bubbles. And one form of a speculative financial bubble would be a the bursting of a kind of a real estate bubble. So over-accumulation of surplus capital looking um, to invest in the built environment, not because the built environment necessarily offers lots of potential new productive industrial uses for that environment, for the exploitation of labor, but just holding on to land right, for its kind of commodity value in its ability to absorb ground rent, uh, the return to real estate, that that actually provides a kind of a financial medium to control and organize um, the way a city is built and, and developed. Now, in Marx's crisis theory, this idea of overaccumulation um, is kind of explosive. So it's a kind of a chaotic event. But what I want to suggest in the case of um, London, and this may have some applications, um, to Malaga is that the overaccumulation process or the crisis process is the norm, um, and the way real estate development operates um, in you know what still is called a kind of a global city context, a, a, an urban context that is trying to attract um, international capital investors, uh, not just to occupy parts of the city, but also to kind of hold kind of financial positions in there. Um, the global city is also about attracting something that I will talk about, um, um, a kind of a, a ranked gradation of the kinds of citizen or urban subject who lives in that place. So it's looking to attract um, capital in the form of money capital, financial capital. It's looking to attract um, technology, um, technology companies, particularly as occupiers, are seen to be extremely valuable um, tenants of this new kind of city, but also this human capital form as well. Right? And so what I want to suggest then is that this normative crisis process, this norm of crisis, this, this over-accumulation of surplus capital that now looks to construct the urban landscape in order to dictate not just the, the rental terms of the use of the inner city, 
uh, but also the, um, the social and cultural form of that city, that's all bound, with a, bound up with a, a system that's, that's um, in a sense, trying to um, ensure that, um, that this process of over-accumulation, it, it, it never ends. Right? Now, there's something else that Marx also said about over-accumulation. He said that over-accumulation creates um, surplus capital on one pole and then surplus labor at the other. So it, it creates uh, huge opportunities for the crystallization and consolidation of private wealth uh, and also creates conditions of immiseration uh, and misery and also the basis of unemployment. Now, Marx was talking about this um, in the context of uh, the mid to late 19th century. And you know, those of you who've kind of followed some of these debates and discussions um, you know, will have, um, I'm thinking of David Harvey and Henri Lefebvre, and the question of um, Paris in the mid 19th century and the, the reconfiguration of Paris um, by Baron Hausmann has always been used as this kind of classic um, case study or example in order to think about how the overaccumulation process works in constructing um, not just a, an infrastructure, roads, buildings, um, uh, bridges, that support this process but also defend it, it also creates a kind of a culture as well. But I, I want to suggest that we can think about this and we can update this framework by looking at um, the urban design practices of urban regeneration and the way in which urban regeneration companies um, like the King's Cross company led by um, the real estate, commercial real estate arm of um, a pension fund uh, called Argent, the way in which they've become the kind of overseers of this problem which the state effectively hands over um, to a commercial real estate operating company, which is there is a social question which is bound up with the need to revalorize and um, reanimate, to revivify, um, uh, not just the, the, the land value of what is seen by the state as wasteland, um, but it's also seen to be in need of this kind of um, um, a kind of a spatial fixing or refixing or reconfiguration, which brings with it then um, a kind of a new spirit, right? A new uh, spirit of um, change, um, some idea of um, a kind of a, a, a vitality, some idea of um, that the place itself manifests the idea and the ideology of um, what society can become. So a lot of this works um, at the level of architecture and urban design because as well as being a process which is about thinking you know, how the state can offload certain assets to private investors and then they can work out um, commercial solutions for the revalorization of land which might have been in public ownership once. Um, they're also increasingly given the job um, of uh, creating a kind of a culture, you know, an environmental culture. There's a kind of em environmentalism which has got nothing to do with um, saving the planet, right? but it's got everything to do with saving capital <laughs> from the problems which this overaccumulation process creates. Okay. So that's a general kind of um, outline of why I'm looking at King's Cross in this way. One of the reasons why I'm looking at King's Cross actually is that I lived in Somers Town, uh, which is a, um, a large uh, council estate, which is just squeezed in between uh, Euston Station, another major transport link in London. Um, King's Cross and St Pancras and also Camden and it's part of the borough of Camden and where I was living in in Somers Town which still is um, a residential neighbor neighborhood um, which is a large kind of thriving um, uh, place of kind of working class people um, you can see that some of the overflow effects or you know, 
what you mean, we might call the kind of spillovers, spillover effects on Summerstown, were changing the place in kind of ways which may be surprising for um, urbanists who study processes like gentrification. Because one of the overflow effects of a major kind of commercial development or regeneration project like King's Cross, you know, will be this um, ratcheting up of um, land values, um, which will take the form of um, letting agents as well as real estate agents. So people who are kind of working on behalf of landlords as well as people who are working on behalf of landowners. Um, there's a kind of a rise in prices and then also a kind of a squeeze on the margins and also the costs to um, maybe the local council about how they're looking at public housing. But as well as all of that, so as well as these potential economic pressures which manifest in kind of gentrification processes which may be pushing right um, low-income urban populations out of these kind of housing centers. There's also something else which is, was happening there, which was just outside my window, which was very strange, which was actually new commercial kind of business uses of very small kind of spaces. And um, so one day um, I woke up and what used to be outside my window, which um, was um, uh, a kind of a media studio, um, so it's a kind of a company that probably was involved in um, producing kind of TV shows um, for Channel 4 and uh, the BBC. Probably been there since the late 1980s. Um, uh, probably in that kind of first wave of kind of restructuring of King's Cross or s first wave of what might be called a, um, a kind of a postmodern or post-Fordist kind of approach to thinking about urban regeneration that they were leaving and some new tenants were moving in and I was you know as a neighbor you're kind of interested right who moves in next door and it was kind of curious that the the new tenant when they put up the new sign on what effectively was regenerated old in 19th century industrial kind of warehouse space the new tenant um, was called benevolent dot artificial intelligence benevolent dot AI, and I just couldn't work out what benevolent dot AI was, but what it was was a kind of a st um, startup incubator for um, uh, a bit, I think it was PhDs who'd finished their work maybe at UCL, which is just around the corner, University College London. Um, or people working at the Crick Institute, which is I'll talk about in a moment, which is um, a major um, laboratory working on, effectively trying to work, work on the cure for cancer. Um, and the idea was you have a startup incubator there called Benevolent.ai for people who are working on commercial applications for um, predictive healthcare technologies. So it's a kind of, if you have it in Malaga, I'm not sure, like a WeWork um, kind of environment, but specifically working in this kind of new field of um, predictive uh, analytics, um, algorithmic approaches to um, to healthcare. And the idea is they provide space and they provide a convivial environment. They also provide access to supercomputers. Uh, and the idea is, I think, if they if they incubate incubate something and then it goes to an IPO initial public offering, then they'll take something as their rent, right? And it was that kind of process, just uh, outside the window, right? With, uh, so it's like the, the, the recodification, actually, of um, industrial space shifting from, um, you know, a commercial use in film and TV, going now to a commercial use in this kind of bleeding edge of um, new technology working in the field of uh, predictive algorithmic computational analysis of, um, of the pathologies of, of the human being that made me think also there's something else going on that we need to look at. Because part of the appeal, I imagine, for um, uh, people working in this uh, incubator was um, maybe it's, it's uh, a good deal on office space, but there was also this 
appeal of this new location, King's Cross. Right? So what I want to do then is just kind of take you through um, how I became interested in a place I thought I knew very well because I was living there. Uh, so what I want to take you through is what we m what might call um, a kind of a conjunctural um, analysis of how the the config the the changing transformation right um, so the changes in the way the urban transformation process is working help us to understand maybe the 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 ideology of this new overdriven overcharged process of uh, financial accumulation. Um, now, when I was talking to Kike um, in that bar a few months ago, um, we were talking about uh, some of these ideas. And I was saying, you know, I'm interested in doing a conjunctural analysis, you know, working with these ideas which are inspired by um, a Marxist analysis to... Um, uh, not just understanding the economy, but how the economy is, is grounded and how that, that grounding of the economy always mobilizes um, the applications of ground rent in order to define its kind of conditions of possibility. I said the reason why I'm interested in Marx is because it gives us a, a method to think about financial accumulation, which is a quantitative, abstract process, but it also allows us then to think about people's everyday lives, right? Particularly the question of people who are at the margin, the poor. The people who are always squeezed by these margins, which are always pushed, because the margin is, a, is the ground beneath one's feet, right? So it's a concrete process of marginalization that you can study. Um, but the reason why I'm interested in this is because you can then use a different range or set of kind of methods to explore these questions, um, one of which comes from a cultural studies approach uh, with Stuart Hall, thinking about a conjunctural analysis of the spatial configuration of power in cities, particularly when that power in cities is mobilized by police and media in order to marginalize working class populations uh, through their kind of um, their racial kind of profile. But what I was talking to Kike about was there's also something interesting in, um, in a book called A Thousand Plateaus by Deleuze and Guattari, uh, where they um, begin to talk about ground rent, right, in this um, very strange chapter called um, The Apparatus of Capture. And, and I was thinking that the apparatus of capture as a, as a concept um, might be an interesting way of thinking about these real estate regimes and how they mediate these, um, the social relations of a city, but also make those social relations of the city bend towards the requirement of the manipulation of um, the productive forces of those social relations. The apparatus of capture is an idea in, as, as far as I can make out from um, reading uh, Deleuze and Guattari, is that th they're saying that um, the state apparatus, um, which in the case of this, you know, would be the local authority bound up then with the Greater London Authority, bound up with the national state. The state apparatus, um, needs to mobilize something which has a kind of an independent ability to assess the relation of forces in any given territory. Right. They've got a line that says, no enterprise can function without being able to map the limits of the possibilities within that territory. And then they use that then to define the thresholds of how that territory can be transformed, okay? Now this idea of um, territorializing space by analyzing certain limitations that can be excited, right, and then prohibited, and therefore it generates a kind of a threshold or set of parameters which then determine the kind of governance of that territory, as well as its 
um, economic exploitation. That seems to me to be a very concrete and kind of practical way to do a analysis, a conjunctural analysis of this kind of urban space, okay? So I've, I've set out there my kind of interest in this, you know, th the fact that it was just around me, um, and also maybe a kind of a method of approach, okay? Um, now, what I'll do is I'll pause and we'll watch, because I think we've got access to the internet and sound. So we'll watch a five minute film, right? Which is produced by um, this kind of business lifestyle magazine called Monocle. I'm not sure if it's still going now. It's run by this, this guy called um, Tyler Brule, who um, I think made his name, actually, it, I, I'm really interested in interior design aesthetics, right? Because this is really bound up with kind of how real estate products are sold. If you notice, when you're looking at um, the way real estate is sold, they usually sell it from the inside out, right? Um, they sell it from the, the, the idea of the occupation of the unit, and then it usually comes with soft furnishings and kind of lighting effects, right, and a feeling of warmth it's in order to give emptiness a structure of feeling, right? Um, and this guy, Tyler Brule, kind of worked on this uh, famous... Um, interior design magazine called Wallpaper, and then kind of had a kind of a career arc, which then moved um, um, to do with kind of testing the kind of quality of different cities, their world-classness, based on the kind of the, the water pressure from a hotel shower or something like that. And he'd write these kind of Financial Times columns talking about urban space or commercial space as, um, as something that can be um, subjected to kind of the uh, judgment of taste. So it's like a new kind of aesthetic analysis. And then he produced this magazine called Monocle. A Monocle got involved then in the kind of global city world ranking kind of game. Um, like MasterCard has its own kind of world ranking of cities, not just based upon kind of logistical requirements, ease of access, you know, ingress and egress out of the space. You know, getting to the airport, getting getting out of town, um, using the tube, finding your way around. Not just that; it would also be these are the cultural elements as well about how easy you can feel at home, even though you're a stranger to that place. And Monocles, have, I think, started doing these um, effectively selling products to real estate companies, which were these um, journalistic editorial. Um, analyses of urban regeneration projects all around the world, and they did one for King's Cross. So to introduce King's Cross, I'll hand over to Monocle, okay? And you can see their film. It's about five minutes. In a city beleaguered by less than stellar developments, more often than not in the form of so-called iconic towers, London has at least one glimmer of hope. This is King's Cross, a 27-hectare mixed-use development in the center of the British capital, nestled against one of its busiest transit hubs. Only half the buildings here are complete, yet already it has become a destination neighborhood. Whether it's diners heading to Granger & Co. or the German gymnasium, swimmers headed to the Ouse Architect Design Pond, or design lovers streaming into the end of year show at world-renowned arts college Central St. Martins. It's expected that this year around 30,000 people will be visiting King's Cross every day. For that, we have to thank its developers, Argent, who have focused just as much on a manifesto of good living as they have on a bottom line. Once we'd been confirmed, uh, one of our first jobs was to write this first document called Principles for a Human City, which was published in July 2001, and we set out 10 principles for what we thought should be a fantastic piece of this world city. And I think the amazing thing about King's Cross is that it's the one project I know where we haven't just achieved the vision, but we've gone beyond it. And the place is setting new standards all the time. To us, the master plan is really the, it's the nolly plan. It's the inverse, it's the, it's the public realm. That's what confers the value. It's creating the arteries of the city for people and goods and trade and value to flow. And then the buildings need to respond to that public realm and enhance it 
And that's the test to us for any good building. But in order to invite the city into King's Cross, Argent prioritized the completion of its public spaces, from Granary Square with its benches and fountains to the revamped canal sidewalk or the grassy Gasholder Park. There will be 10 new squares and parks here, and nearly all are ready for use. It's no doubt at the, a pivotal moment for how we knew that this place was going to be a success locally as well as, if you like, for London was when we opened Granary Square and we just watched urban life come and invade and use Granary Square. And I remember one of the early mornings standing in the square and one of the guys that runs the estate team was standing there and he said to me, they're all coming with their beach towels and their scooters and their kids and their dogs. What do you want us to do? Uh, and uh, we said, encourage it. Um, which I don't think was the answer that he was necessarily expecting. That's not to say that commissioning good architecture will be any less of a key component in the success of King's Cross. International names such as Thomas Heatherwick, David Chipperfield and Stanton Williams will all have buildings here, yet none will shout. There are no real iconic buildings. They're all very good in their details, but they all sit together quite comfortably with the other. They don't fight. Uh, with each other and I think one of the great things that they've done here is they've actually made the historic buildings really work for the regeneration project. The central St Martin's development was one of the first buildings to be occupied. It's an old granary building dating back to the 19th century, been beautifully restored by Stanton Williams architects and it creates a real buzz because it's a university, it's a creative centre, it's a focus for the site, but it also means that it enlivens all these public spaces around here. Strong ideas about people, community and urban character are paired with an enviable roster of occupants. Google, Universal Music, Louis Vuitton and Havas have all signed up. We've always tried to avoid the idea here that King's Cross would be a campus of a particular type of industry. Uh, we've always wanted it to be a kind of fusion, a melting pot, uh, um, an eclectic mixture of different things where art can meet science, where it can meet business, where it can meet other types of commerce. And one of the things we've realised in talking to all these businesses is they want to be near other types of businesses. It's that um, interplay that so many of them are, are, are looking for. So breadth and depth uh, is what we've been trying to, to provide here. High quality architecture, open public space, and world-class businesses and institutions. These are all ingredients in the success of King's Cross, but most importantly, it's about a long-term vision with quality of life at its core. The methodology they've used to deliver it is a very powerful one and creates this very coherent piece of city. And I think that's particularly important for London because London, you know, we all know of it as a city of villages. So that means creating specific characters in different places whether it's north, east, south, they, they, these should feel different and so they should be curated in the sort of way that uh, Argent here have managed to curate King's Cross. However, the work here is far from finished. Cities are constantly evolving and so the Argent team will stay hard at work to keep King's Cross a lively and dynamic part of London, even after the construction cranes have all gone. In London, from Monocle, I'm David Michel. Okay, so that gives you um, a kind of a, an overview um, of the way in which this project is both presented, um, but also the way in which um, the ideology of it as this kind of new template or new machine actually, right? Because it, it seemed to be something which has like a number of different kind of um, um, parts and kind of mechanisms, and and also it's it's interesting that the that that guy Peter Murray said it's not about um, you know what's called iconic architecture. It's about like a collection of elements. So this is where the new urbanism aspect of it comes into it because if you look at the the story, which we haven't got time to get into, but if you look at the story of um, the develop of, of the biography, actually, of Argent as a as a company. Hang on. Control now. Because I want to show you another a video as well. If you look at the, the biography of uh, 
Argent, they actually learned their trade um, through the, 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 the bursting of the commercial real estate bubble, bubble and residential bubble in the late 80s and 90s. And so actually they were, they were formed by looking at the problems of the creation of the investment zone, the, the special economic zone of uh, Canary Wharf. Right? They looked at and they understood at the time in the early 1990s in London that Canary Wharf was in trouble and the problem, the perceived problem of the trouble of Canary Wharf in London was the fact that it was effectively just an upscale um, um, industrial estate for financial services. It was kind of like a monolithic, monotonic, um, monotonous environment for one particular type of client and if that client doesn't want it then you're in trouble particularly if you've geared up public services and transport all around this particular consumer of urban space and Argent in the 1990s and 2000s got interested then in this idea about well what if we do as a pension fund what if we do because we can take a long-term look at the the timelines demographics the kind of economic financial trajectories of places why don't we think about place building place making and the language of what was then called in New Labour Urban Policy, Urban Renaissance. And, and this, in a way, is when that, um, the, the, the developer from Argent is talking, he says, look, we've realized then this system, this machinic process, which is reconfigurable, which is not dictated and determined by any one occupier demand, that is meant to give something uh, back to the city, so it's meant to be a piece of the city, and there's a new postcode now which has been minted for this place. So London, I think it's the first time in like 75 years, London's actually got a new territory, right? It's got a new postcode called N1C with Cold Drops Yard, which is this. Right, I'm going to speed up now because I think I can unpack more of this maybe in, in some of the conversation, but where I want to end up with is is, is thinking about um, King's Cross um, and the urban design kind of intervention as a process which is interested in absorbing surplus capital and managing that surplus capital uh, because uh, effectively the client, right, for the, the benefits that come through um, the payments of kind of rents and the consumption of this urban space which happens here is um, is a financial kind of um, institutional investor kind of um, uh, arrangement apparatus that the that what's being shaped here is not just the the physical landscape um, it's the social relations between people so that they can create a kind of a configuration of subjectivity or a mode of subjectivation which is seen to be the way in which you deal with the problems of capitalist cities on all of the, the social and economic problems they generate. So this is meant to be a kind of um, the solution that capitalism generates for the problems which it causes. Okay, so that's, that's what I'm effectively saying is if I was presenting this and I was from Argent, right, or maybe I was from the LGA, right, or if I'm sympathetic to this machine, I'd say to you, come and visit, come and look, look what we've done, learn, right? And maybe you can try out smaller versions of it because you probably won't be able to work on the scale with this kind of ambition. Um, but we're certainly interested in you um, in Malaga, um, wherever it is in the world, um, picking up some of these ideas. And we're happy to share and through a knowledge exchange process, right? Because they want this kind of approach to proliferate because there's brand values associated with it. Um, because the success of Arjun's approach to King's Cross has led to something that Marx also talked about, which was a centralization of capital. So not just concentration of capital in one company, a centralization process. Because um, the success of um, the regeneration of King's Cross has led to um, a merger with a New York-based real estate company called Realty, who are responsible for the regeneration of Hudson Yards, right? Um, which also has a kind of a Thomas Heatherwick kind of public space. But it's less successful there because 
apparently it was shut down because people who are visiting this inverted, inverted kind of honeycomb shape, um, apparently, I don't know if this is true or not, uh, but, but apparently there was a public health kind of problem with it because there was a fear that people would throw themselves off this giant inverted kind of public park honeycomb thing, right? So um, the, the project in New York, Hudson Yards, has had like a, a, a more difficult kind of public reception and, they've, and they merged with, or they created this partnership with Argent, because Argent seemed to create this sympathetic thing. Now what's happening now with Argent and King's Cross is that within London, now King's Cross is being seen as um, a solution to um, urban unrest and urban crisis. So in Tottenham, the London 2011 um, urban riots, which um, began after the police shooting and murder of Mark Duggan uh, in, um, in Tottenham, in Tottenham Hale, and then proliferated um, in urban centres across the UK. Uh, there was an urban regeneration problem and project which was set in motion. And Argent now is seen to be um, uh, the urban developers who are given the task of developing solutions, particularly because of their way of not only understanding how uh, the physical industrial landscape can be regenerated, Argent seemed to understand also about the way in which the cultural consumption of these industrial environments through um, dance music, rave music, kind of youth culture, that this also can be um, created into kind of lifestyle packages that can solve the problems of kind of anime and kind of resistance to police authority that have kind of sparked riots and urban rebellions in in London. And I'm just seeing if I've got an image. Oh, so this is an image of Broadwater Farm. Broadwater Farm in Tottenham, obviously the scene of um, urban revolt and rebellion against police violence in, in the early 1980s, and then the starting point of this flashpoint of the urban riots in London in 2011. Now Tottenham is is being experimented with as a location uh, in order to see if these processes that have been pioneered at King's Cross can be mobilized now as solutions for the underlying um, conditions of kind of urban um, um, oppression and domination that, that British capitalism um, kind of cleaves to. And these are some of the images then for the, uh, the new Tottenham, right, which look a bit like the new King's Cross, particularly in this kind of recomposition of elements. Now, what I want to end with then is this idea that um, instead of presenting King's Cross to you as something that you as urban planners and urban designers may, you can learn from and then proliferate in your own backyards, actually what you should do if you go to King's Cross, and maybe you've already been there and looked at it, um, is look at it in order to do an analysis of the problem King's Cross represents because King's Cross represents a problem in the form of a solution to the crises of capitalism. And I think if we look at King's Cross and then do an analysis of where it's going and what its kind of tendencies are, we may be able to um, build an understanding of how capitalism is urbanizing, not only to um, hold on to and preserve its power over um, the physical environment, but how it's also now working to kind of shape and inform um, the structure of feeling and the ensemble of social relations, which actually give places their, their sense of dynamism and, and um, their sense of uh, contingency and kind of volatility and creativity. So um, I'll end then with one more video, um, which is another um, video that's intended to sell King's Cross, but what's being sold here now is the idea of the urban subject, okay? Uh, and it's an urban subject that's been cultured and nurtured by the conjunctural elements which are configured in this space. So it's the university, Central St. Martins. It's a, uh, a new kind of experimental kind of shopping neighborhood which has got not just cars and, um, you, you know, um, Th they're meant to be like the experimental vendors, the, the workshops, the kind of fashion workshops, because they're meant to link into Central St. Martin's kind of school of fashion. So the whole place is meant to be a place where you can experiment with subjectivity, and this is one of the, the attractors that are bringing 
in um, a kind of investor interest into this place. King's Cross is quite amazing as somewhere where London, the continent, the north comes together. At Central St. Martins, I'd say only about a third of my students are actually from the UK. People want to be around new ideas, they want to be around change, they want to be somewhere that feels international. And having the world's top art college in the middle of that development is an incredibly smart move. I used to study at Central St. Martins and I've now started running with Nike. There's a Nike store opening in King's Cross. We'll be starting something called the Ready, Set, Go Run, which is a run especially for new runners. The canal's such a good spot for running. You can actually go all the way from East London all the way to Paddington via King's Cross, which is really nice. We started Spiritland in a restaurant in Shoreditch, playing music on a very nice system, and we always wanted to open a full-time venue. And just from you know meeting the people who were setting up King's Cross, it was clear that they were looking to do something exceptional and bring in one-off people that would create interest. I was kind of really interested in how King's Cross was really evolving as an environment, as a destination for consumers. Cool Drops yards just makes for a great hub. And of course, all the big mainstream brands have amazing retail environments in London. For me, it's more about, you know, the more artisanal elements that you can find in London, which kind of sets us apart. Okay, so I'll leave that there then. Um, so th what I'm trying to suggest is that this new urbanism, this new spirit of um, the urban kind of regeneration of capital brings with it uh, an idea of an environment um, that becomes both a means of capturing capital, but that environment, that enclosure, that bubble actually becomes then an aesthetic environment and a framework of judgment. There's a new humanism which comes with it. And I want to say this hu new humanism is, 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 is a problem. And particularly when it's kind of proliferating with... Um, with these kind of tendential effects where it's becoming now the kind of solution to the fundamental race class problems of a colonial nation like, um, like Britain, the UK. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, we, we open up the space for questions, preguntas. Uh, I would like to start. Um <coughs> yeah, first, thank you very much. It was very interesting. And I, and I think it's very um, kind of stimulating maybe the, the concept of uh, spatial conjuncture mm -hmm. that I, I, I think it's really in the middle of of how as you were saying the apparatus of, of uh, capture are uh, working so we need also to improve kind of new also uh, theoretical um, uh, yeah approaches to to understand the the, the new complexities as, as you were saying about how uh, yeah, urban development and also uh, capital urbanization is working. And I think in the in the concept of uh, of conjuncture uh, that in a way it's working about the the joinings, how how the the the, the joinings are working yeah. in this new algorithmic and machinic uh, uh, forms of uh, capture. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is quite. Uh, interesting in, in going deep in this. Uh, so I was uh, maybe wondering if you could uh, develop a bit more or saying something about how this uh, conjuncture uh, develops. Because for me, and I think was clear also in your uh, 
uh, presentation uh, that it has a certain form of uh, injunction that it's also uh, uh, connected with the idea of uh, of join but in a way in another form uh, uh, because injunction we don't have it in Spanish but it means like a mandate or a okay. prohibition or uh, yeah, yeah. I mean uh, not with the same root uh, of the of the word but I, I, I think this is uh, also quite uh, interesting to work in, in, in or to understand how these forms of capture are, are uh, is working in, in uh, developing the representation of uh, joinings in a way yeah but with a background or a, yeah, but rooted in a forms of injunction of, uh, yeah, uh, capture in a way. So it's, it's uh, yeah, y you have this feeling of uh, joining, but it's always uh, codified in, in certain forms of joining. Uh, and, uh, and I think this is quite interesting and important to see how, um, deep is the complexities of uh, yeah, understanding how uh, subjectivity is uh, captured and at the same time uh, sell or mm -hmm. sold uh, in the sense of uh, that you feel that the, the, the idea is uh, behind it is kind of, uh, yeah, uh, yeah we, we could develop on the idea of uh, freedom of other mm -hmm concepts that are also very rooted in this idea. So yeah, I, I was just uh, thinking if you have uh, yeah, something uh, on, on, on this uh, conjuncture in the sense of uh, conjoining uh, in how this is uh, developed. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, I think what I'm trying to say about, can you hear? Is this on? Yeah, uh, I, think, I think what I'm trying to say about King's Cross is that um, it's, it's, it is pleasurable, right, to go there, right? So this thing about then the message or the injunction or the, the appeal, the attraction, right? It's meant to attract, as, the, um, um, as, the, as somebody was saying in that video, right? It, 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 it's meant to attract people who carry interest, right? It's meant to animate a kind of a sense of, an authentic sense of an, of an active, busy, changing urban environment, right? It's not meant to be, I think one urban sociologist talked about Canary Wharf in the, the early 2000s, even though I actually quite like Canary Wharf, to just kind of hang around. I like the, the feeling of kind of um, American psycho business emptiness that, that you get from Canary Wharf, right? But, um, but somebody said about it's the simulation of an idea of urban life, right? Which you get with Canary Wharf. Whereas in King's Cross, it's meant to be, no, 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 this is, the, the production of the urban ensemble of relations. This is the production of the, the kind of dynamism. So there is, I think, something kind of like very sophisticated about it. Um, but if you look at the conjuncture of kind of elements, right, and then if you do, you know, Stuart Hall says, a conjunctural kind of analysis is meant to not only just describe and list the kind of the, vari the variegated kind of contents and elements of of, of social space, but it's meant to be a, a political analysis of a dynamic of tension. And if you look at the tensions, right, between the different elements which are being prescribed, right, as being the conditions of a successful city, of a new humanist city or whatever, then those prescriptions come with prohibitions, right? So, for example, the prescription of, at a kind of a cultural use of um, King's Cross is, you know, kind of an Instagram kind of relationship to space, right? Because you enjoy being there, you enjoy the environment. Also, there's something kind of surprising about the conjugation of elements. You know, um, I don't know if I got it in the image, but this is empty because this is during COVID. Um, but, uh, I took a picture of it. But they've got kind of ga gas holders, which used to be these... Um, um, kind of relics of um, containers for kind of housing of kind of gas and oil, you know, to heat a city. And those are now being turned into um, kind of cases for, you know, upscale cylindrical urban housing concepts, right? Uh, so those things, housing, 
um, upscale space next to a kind of a Thomas Heatherwick um, treatment of, of um, these um, remolded, um, redesigned um, old kind of industrial warehouse spaces for, for Samsung to show off its new product line. Those things are meant to attract kind of um, a need to take pictures. Right? So the idea is that you document your life in an open space, whatever. But that injunction, as you say, right, in order to take pictures, enjoy, is based upon a kind of an idea that there are other forms of everyday life, right? And there are resistances also to those injunctions and to the way in which urban space is prescribed, um, that those things are neutralized to a certain extent, right? So I think you can do a conjunctural analysis of King's Cross in order to, to, to see um, the kind of the negative conjuncture, right, of the conditions of kind of police power, the conditions of kind of renter power, you know, the conditions of, you know, a conservative government that, um, that seems to exist in order to support a kind of society which is based around owning private property or, or the, the acquisition of kind of a mortgage, say, which can enter you into those circuits. So I want to suggest that you can do an analysis of this to throw into relief the kind of problems of a society that generate a different kind of will to kind of enjoy and participate in urban space, right, through direct kind of antagonism with the law and force of private property. So I think you can do... This is maybe where you kind of can push um, urban theorization to a certain extent, is that as well as just developing an analysis of capital from the basis of, you know, finance capital always wants to kind of accumulate um, itself in global city locations. Well, you can actually say, well, it doesn't know how to get under the skin of those urban spaces. And this is where architecture and urban design and culture more broadly, and also the history of urban culture, then plays a role because certain aspects and attributes get incorporated and folded into these apparatuses of capture. And I think what we need to do is... Um, you know, as well as actively kind of resisting um, and, um, and calling out processes and practices of gentrification and kind of and the, um, the violent role of kind of police force forces in um, managing and um, um, modulating the rel social relations of cities. We should also kind of look at the way in which culture is now becoming this aesthetic framework to judge the quality of social life in cities because I think this is now being this has become part of the the machineries and the mechanisms that the, the private arms of the states like real estate private operating companies the, these are the ways in which they um, exercise their force but also then present their force as something which is kind of benign and 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 good you know it's part of a contribution to civil society Thank you. So, uh, questions, comments? Thank you very much. That was really fascinating. I mean, given that this uh, conference is, is focused on uh, touristification, if we're thinking about uh, conjunction and yeah. potentially uh, folding uh, tourism into that, yeah. I was wondering if you might be able to kind of speculate on to what extent you see tourism and tourism capital as being part of the formation, the creation of these spaces, or is it just something that seems to, to piggyback the creation of these spaces that's mostly intended for, uh, uh, for local okay. uh, consumption? Okay. There's, well, there's, there's two ways of kind of answering that, right? The, the, the first way um, is, is the space is built for tourism, right? And it's meant to um, generate a kind of an interest in itself so that the, this ensemble of elements, yeah, the apparatus is meant to excite a kind of an interest and attract interest. And it needs to do that as well for the success of this new commercial kind of shopping district called um, Cold Drops Yard. Because if you're an urban planner, right, and if you're thinking about creating kind of shopping districts, they usually think about shopping. You need to make sure a shopping district is on the way to something, you know, so that it can drag in kind of footfall. It can drag in consumers. And so that they... they um, 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 you know, they can, you can just capture passing trade, right? Um, but this is meant to be in itself a destination, which is quite a difficult thing to do. You know, in the 1980s or, you know, in the UK, 
building on the kind of US models of kind of large scale kind of um, luxury shopping, big box shopping malls. You know, the reason why out of town, out of city shopping kind of works in these centers is because um, you avoid the traffic in the inner city, you avoid uh, congestion, but then these spaces have to attract, right? So that they have to have a kind of, kind of an appeal. They have to provide a kind of a warmth and they have to provide enough distractions that can hold you there for a full day. And I think these places do the same maybe for tourism because I think King's Cross now is on the tourist map. You know, Canary Wharf began to rethink itself, I think, in the, um, the late 2000s as actually a tourist destination. The City of London, you know, which is a business district for not just financial services, but, you know, uh, um, solicitors, insurance firms, they began to see their architecture itself, right, as a part of a tourist pool. Now, the other way you can look at this would be more abstractly is that you've got the tourism then of, you know, people visiting like a, like a, a city like London, and wanting to see its manifold attractions. But then there's another kind of tourism, which is the tourism of capital, right? Because tour- capital is, is, is constantly in circulation, looking for new destinations, new horizons. And I think there is a relationship then between this um, uh, human spatialized approach to creating places which attract um, attention, you know, as well as um, attract um, sp- uh, you know, the commercial um, uses of a particular space and also this need for kind of capitalism to uh, constantly be in circulation, finding new um, points of kind of valorization. Hi, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. Uh, my question is about really that, that probably that um, newspaper headline, uh, and it's in the line. Um, I mean, I was wondering if you have any data on the uh, demographic impact of this development on the on the area, on the you know, um, yeah, the demographics, the composition of the pre-existing um, inhabitants, and, 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 and you know how how it, how they, what, what is the trend. Um, yeah, I've got. I, I, yeah, sorry, I don't have any because um, uh, th- that would be the kind of the, the next stage of, um, so, of of kind of research. Because particularly what I want to do in Tottenham uh, um, and look at the expansion of this kind of Argent approach to Tottenham is that um, the solutions that that this new Argent project um, is meant to provide will be based upon the. Um, the, ana- the analytic success, right, of what it's done in King's Cross. So, um, yeah, I do want to look at that, but I, I don't have that, um, that information to hand. Um, this one, this presentation is more kind of polemical. Um, then, but there is some ana- analysis there, hopefully. Um, this image has got nothing to do with kind of King's Cross. This, um, this was when um, an architect who's... Um, in charge of Zaha Hadid architecture, a guy called Patrick Schumacher, and and he was caught um, on camera um, uh, making some remarks about um, the social job or mission, right, of archi- urban architecture in the 21st century, and um, and and. It, and it wasn't too much of a caricature, actually, this headline, for once, for the Evening Standard, right? And it's interesting that it made its front cover as well. And I think this was back in, like, 2016. And, and he said, we can't fix the social questions of the city, but what we can do is use the, uh, the accumulated wealth in order to experiment with a new kind of urban aesthetics, right? And he says, therefore, um, that question of the social problem, the residential problem of... of urban occupiers and cities who can't afford to live there, who can't make rent, it effectively it's just F them. You know, that, he didn't say that necessarily, but this is, this, is, this, this is the point, right? And so it would be interesting, I think, to track, to do a kind of quantitative analysis, I think, an empirical survey of, um, there are concrete displacement effects you can see, in, particularly in places like Elephant and Castle in London, where the local authorities have just been the willing kind of supplicant and and uh, instruments of whatever it is a large-scale real estate company needs and wants, right? I think it's more interesting actually to look at the the displacement effects in places like King's Cross because I think they're going to be more subtle, 
because they don't want to be, be seen as like a classic pariah developer because part of their brand value is bound up with this kind of social mission. So it'd be interesting to see what the, um, the displacement effects, both on the residential side, also on the commercial side, because um, as I was saying, one of the uh, immediate kind of changes was the kind of business uses of very small bits of urban space, you know, like these kind of workshops. Yeah, but that's more work to come, I think. Thank you. More questions? It's got to be the coffee break now, Kike. <coughs> no, the coffee break is a bit uh, later. Now oh we yes, have, uh, 12 o'clock. <laughs> yeah. What's going on with that? <laughs> yeah, our timings are different. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if there are not uh, further questions, we move directly to the, to the first panel. Uh, la primera mesa. ¿Os parece? Okay. So thank you very much, uh, Luis. Thanks a lot. Yes.